Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. It's another of our shows leading up until the election in November. All of these shows are covering the Washington County Senate race, the Montpelier State House race, as well as Bill Fraser covering the parking garage bond as well as the water bond. Now today I'm honored to have one of our candidates for the House, Mary Hooper. Hi Richard. Mary, a lot of people know you. How long have you been in the State House? Um, I am, have served there for 10 years, so five terms, and so I'm up for my election for the sixth term. And before that, what was your career? Yeah. And, and during that, um, I served for eight years as the mayor of Montpelier, um, so four terms as, as mayor, and that overlapped uh, a little bit. I was elected mayor in 2004 and then elected um, to the State House in 2008. Prior to that, um, I had, I, actually I'd taken a couple of years off from working. I had been uh, the commissioner of what was then the Department of Labor and Industry, and uh, a job that I loved, really fascinating work, good, good work on behalf of working people in the state of Vermont. But I found myself all over the state and not dedicated in working in my community. And I wanted to take a few years to just be in Montpelier and to really focus on community matters. And so I thought I'd take, you know, maybe two years off from, I've, I've always worked, I've, I've, I've worked since I was 14 or 15 and always held a job. And so I thought, just take a little break. Uh, did some volunteer work, I was on a, committee that uh, thought about how we do downtown redevelopment and what it takes to make our downtown a vital uh, functioning place. Now All what we, year would that have been? 1999. And you were looking at a parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> Always. We'll come back to that perhaps. But it was actually, it was an interesting project. There were 20 or so of us on this committee that was appointed by the city council they really did a deep dive into what makes a functioning, effective downtown. What are the what are the elements of it? And um, so we and we we followed a model that's called the Main Street model and thought about um, economic development uh, and uh, the the appearance, the 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 vibe, how how it feels when you're in the community. Uh, how you promote the community and how you have an organization that supports that work. That became what is now known as Montpelier Alive. So I was the first executive director of that organ. I, I worked on this committee and then I said, I've got to get a job, folks. Time to get, you know, get back in the workforce. And they said, well, you know, will you be our, our first executive director? So I did that for a couple of years and then I was elected mayor. Now, in the State House, the Montpelier Alives are all over the state, actually. Mm -hmm. those, those economic development yeah. functions and promoting downtown. Yeah. Do you ever see issues in the State House that relate to the downtowns and to the how, how the communities develop themselves economically? Oh, absolutely. Can and you give a yeah. couple of examples? Well, it, it, interestingly, the whole notion of how you do community development, and I would say it's community development, it's not just economic development. What is the and distinction in, between well, community development and so community if you're economic just, development? Yeah. So if you're just focused on you know, making sure the, that the retailers are you know, doing well, incredibly important work, and of course we need to be focused on that, you need to also think about how you invite the community into into the downtown and how you engage them so that they want to support the initiatives that you need to be making uh, to support those downtown retailers. Uh, you, you know, if you, you know how we love our downtown in Montpelier, and, but if we didn't feel that way, folks would be doing more online buying than they're doing now or scooting And you could substitute Montpelier for, for Middlebury other, for yeah. Um, yeah. Brattleboro for any of them, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a deeper passion for Montpelier. I mean, we've got something pretty special going on here. Uh, that, but, but you have to nurture, nurture that. It doesn't happen accidentally. 
that actually uh, was one of the tags that we had for what was then called the Montpelier Downtown Community Association. And we picked that cumbersome name very intentionally because we wanted it to be about not just economic development, but about community and how you invite the community in and ask the community to support How that. does that play in the State House, in, in the House? Okay, so, I mean, it, in a variety of ways, and it's where I started to go, when it, there, we passed legislation, it was probably in the mid-90s, and I was fortunate to work on that when I w worked in the executive branch, that put a number of incentives and provisions in state law that said essentially we value our downtown and we want to figure out ways to make investments in our downtowns. And um, so in statute are provisions that say if you become a designated downtown there are certain opportunities that flow to you. Um, some of them are tax credits. I worked on bringing lots of tax credits into the downtown, a couple million dollars worth of tax credits to private individuals. Um, back in those days, we had grants, and brought some sprinkler grants mm -hmm. in because I was worried about buildings burning. Um, huge threat to our downtowns is, you know, buildings burning one at a time and losing that fabric of the community. Um, Nowadays, we have tax increment finance districts. What is a tax increment finance oh, district? I'm, I won't give a very good answer. You should have people. Well, if it's who not a good answer, heads. at least make it short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a mechanism that allows a community that has gone through a number of steps to recapture the education portion of the of the property tax and retain it to, to pay for the cost of bonds. For, for making, infrastructure. For infrastructure, for, for making civic improvements. So it's a way of trying to focus growth into our, our developed communities, which is important. You want people on our water and sewer and using um, our roads rather than out developing uh, cornfields. When we talk about a town, we not only talk about the businesses, mm -hmm. we not only talk about the downtown, but we talk about the schools. Yeah. And every legislative session, school finance yeah. is up front and then ends up at the very, very end of the session. It starts the session mm -hmm. and then it ends up in a crunch at the end of the session. Why? It's hugely complex and it's deeply personal. I mean, I, I, I've always said I would never serve on a school board because it's the most difficult civic position you can take because you're talking about So you're about saying that John Holler is a masochist for <laughs> not only having <laughs> served did. on the school board but been yeah. mayor. Yeah. You're, you're, you are making decisions that affect ch children's lives and that is, that is huge. But they're also civic yeah. lives. You know, yeah, the schools course. determine yeah. the civic life of the yeah. city or yeah. the town. A absolutely. And personally, I think that is one of the more troubling things about what is now Act 46, which has been this school consolidation. School consolidation, um, you know, done under the rubric of we're going to save tax money. Big important question of you know how do you control expenses? Um, we could have a long conversation about whether or not that was accomplished. Do you think it was accomplished in a short conversation? No. Why not? Well, because, I mean, logically, you would think yeah. it, it would do that. So I think that there were going to be some savings that some communities were already going to do the consolidation. And we saw that happen with a, the, the first bunch of communities that ran in and took advantage of, what was it, I think? A there, ten, were there were incentives. Well, there were huge incentives. Right. There was a 10 percent um, deduction or reduction in your property tax on the education side that the rest of us paid for. So it wasn't, I mean, theoretically you are saving money because you're consolidating, but I think when you do that analysis that you're not seeing that you're getting rid of that many school administrators or that you're seeing those sort of changes, what you're seeing is a change in spending patterns rather than a reduction in spending. But what you've lost, which is where you began, which is what does that do to the community? In some places it may strengthen the community, but particularly in rural communities where 
the school is what you do. It is where you know, it is where you see your neighbors. You know, it's grandparents going to watch basketball games, but it's also just it's where stuff happens. You know, unlike Montpelier, where we have other excuses to get together. We've got you know the farmers market right. and you know different festivals. So we have a way of pull, of drawing ourselves together. But these small communities, their school is the heart and soul of their community. And I, I fear for them that they're going to lose their heart and soul as, as schools are closed. Do you feel that perhaps it's worth visiting uh, what Maine has, which is each county is mm -hmm. a separate supervisory district. So in Vermont, we would have 14 supervisory yeah. districts. So, uh, I think there maybe are fair discussions about should we have different governance structures. People have pointed to Maine, and the fact is that after Maine uh, instituted that consolidation approach, they said, whoops, that was a mistake, and they have been backing off of that. Well, they had a vote then. that verified it yeah. initially, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but they, have, they have rethought that and are right. trying to figure out how to, you know, if, if that was the right sort of thing to do. What about uh, in the last legislative session, the uh, unified teacher health contract? Let's stay on schools for a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. What were your thoughts on that? How'd you vote on that? I voted, or, so the first half of the biennium, um, there was a proposal to do that and we turned that back and I voted to turn it back, to say no. I, am, I tried as hard as I could to get the provision that calls, that essentially creates a unified statewide um, teacher's health care contract. They put it in the budget at the end of the day, and it was a very last minute move. Now we're talking about the beginning and the and end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and there's a reason these things happen. But I, I would like to say I voted against it, but I could not vote against the budget. And so I, I voted for the budget, which had I, a provision. I actually shouldn't have framed yeah. it that way. I yeah. should have said, do you support that? Do you I, think that no. notion ultimately will help in cost containment uh, and, and will hurt this? You know, there's, yes, it's cost containment. Two, it takes away some local bargaining power or bargaining control I, or... So what disturbs me about that is, is that I think it's an intrusion upon bargaining and a bo in, into the basic construct of uh, labor management agreements. Once you take health care out of it, um, it, it health care and wages are integrally related. There's, there, there's no distinction. And, um, you know, people will frequently b bargain for lower wages in exchange for, you know, a decent right, right. health. And so separating the two is just logically inconsistent to me. I think the net result is that, in fact, and it, let me come back. So w there were different units around the state who um, particularly, not teachers as much, but the other people who participate, so it, uh, folks, janitors, uh, cafeteria workers, right. folks like that, have uh, in many parts of the state bargained for really nice health care benefits in exchange for pretty lousy wages. Um, and suddenly, the They're, ground shifts. Yeah, the ground shifts, and um, I'm really worried about that group of people. And I mean, I've always been ashamed that we're not willing to pay the workers who who keep our systems moving and going. Not 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 just the professionals, but the people who are cleaning cleaning rooms and feeding our kids aren't paid w livable wages. Why um, is that? If it's a local decision, yeah. town by town, why well, is that? So that's the interesting thing of, you know, so we weigh that against tax rates. And, you know, I've sat there as, as mayor and, and supported budgets that, you know, I would have liked to have paid better wages. Actually, I think the city's done the pretty city's well done on, pretty that, on that side, so I'm proud of that. But you, know, you, you, you make those, those choices. You, kn you know what people are willing to tolerate in terms of uh, 
property tax payments. And I think schools are making those decisions, making those choices. And um, folks who are, some folks don't have very strong voices in that process, which makes me a big union supporter because it gives unions enable people who do individually do not have strong voices to um, amplify their voice and to. Do you believe when people say that the um, the unified health contract is the beginning step to a unified teachers contract, to a statewide teachers contract? I think we're moving in that direction, and um, in, in interestingly, would Vermont support that? Well, and I, I, it's hard to imagine. And so, the, so the notions of having county-based um, systems are interesting. I, I come back to the value not only of our schools as centers of our communities, but towns are also the centers of our How many school boards do we have? I know, it's, it's a huge number and, and it's difficult to bring people in. I, I understand those problems and I think those are fair observations, but I would much rather go down to the end of the street, at the, you know, the other end of State Street, and talk to um, my school board member at a school board meeting, then get in the car, and well, now the way the good folks in Roxbury are going, to, well, right. we, we share where our school board meetings okay. are, but suddenly you feel a little removed, you wonder if they're gonna listen to you, are you gonna have as, as strong of a voice, you don't live next door to those folks necessarily so that they know you and you have a personal relationship. There's a loss there. Uh, do you feel that the legislature's relationship with the Department of Education and with the state school board <laughs> is it as it always has been? No, that's changed. And How so? So, I, so remember that the agency of, it, of, of it education is separate from the, the school state board. Right. school, uh, whatever it's called. The superintendent. No, no, the um, Board of Education right. is a separate entity and is not run by the Agency of right. Education. It used to be, so, so those are two separate and distinct entities. It used to be that the, who, the person who is now the Secretary of Education was in, independent of the governor's office, mm -hmm. and that has changed, and I think that is a profound change in the way we look at education. It used awesome. to be, arguably, it was a isolated from politics, from the politics of the executive branch, of a governorship. Right, right. Which is, a, I mean, governors should be political. That's what we elect them to do. But we want the administrative functions to be separate, and particularly of education. I would love to see that not part of a political football. In terms of education, we've been talking micro mm -hmm. education on the school level. How do you finance that beast? Yeah, yeah, so therein lies the trouble. Um, and I think that we need to be moving more rapidly toward uh, an income-based system of financing it. Uh, which brings all sorts of interesting challenges with it to figure out. What, what is the problem with the current system that's part yeah. income and, and part yeah. property? Yeah, well, because it's, it's been cobbled together so much over, over the years that there are probably, you know, four people in the whole state of Vermont who can accurately describe the way it works, and I'm sure not one of them. Uh, so we've tried to make it a fair and equitable system, but we just keep building on it without, um, you know, every once in a while you need to tear it down, step back, and re go, go back up from the ground up. The governor, when he first came in two years ago, mm -hmm. tried that in terms of his initiative to hold a separate vote that was quickly oh. disposed of. Um, because he felt that yeah. income sensitivity makes people less aware of what the school budgets were. Is there? So just to be clear, he did not try to um, revamp the education financing system. What he did through his proposal to um, 
his proposal, which was to essentially set aside all of the budgets that school boards had already done. Right, They'd exactly. Already it, done all it came of the at work. the very beginning before, yeah. several months before town meeting day. Yeah. Well, it, it came so late in the process right. that you couldn't put a but proper if, budget in front of people. Had he said, I'm going to do this next yeah. year, was there merit in that in your view? Or? So he used the bully pulpit to say that budgets are too high and um, they need to be reduced. Even though they were massively approved. Well, so even though they were massively approved and in fact the rate of increase wanted to say was virtually zero, but it was less than 2%. The school boards, the second year, school boards brought in budgets that were lower than what the governor said they should do, and then he still said that wasn't good enough. How would you see it fundamentally changed? You said changing it over to income, less dependence mm -hmm. on property. What would that mean to the average person? It and means, what would it mean yeah. to the wealthy person? What yeah. would it mean to the yeah. poor person? Yeah. Well, therein lie all of the really thorny questions, and I'm not sure. It, it, it's pretty easy for us all to say, oh, tax the, the rich, and that'll take care of our problems. And we basically do not have enough, enough rich people to And you'd lose some if you that. stay. I, and if I'm you tried not that. sure, you know, that's what people say, but it's interesting that, in fact, we ha seem to have an in migration of people of, of, with wealth. Um, so I'm not sure. It, because I think they're coming here because we're a pretty fabulous place. Process wise, how do you grab a consensus to change something yeah. that fundamental? Yeah. Because the next question after this is going to be Act 250, <laughs> which is another one that, that you yeah. know, how do you change these things that are so yeah. structurally fundamental yeah. in education? Every year we say we're going to do it, we never do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we as In the house. A, well, I was going to say we as a society and as Vermonters, and certainly in the house, we tend to approach these things incrementally rather With than studies and task forces. Well, but but are, we do a little bit here. I mean, a little bit more each year, um, and sometimes that gets us to the right place, or sometimes it gets us to an incredibly complex system, like our education financing system. And so, yes, in fact, we do have yet another um, tax study that is, we had a very good one that I thought was the basis for making some of those fundamental changes where there were thoughtful people who, you know, reached you know, close to a consensus on what to do, but we re they didn't tackle the property tax side of things. And this study is essentially an addendum. So we have a study committee that's, I think, going to be a couple of years long okay. that is, you know, tackling that. And so I think we're going to look at, at, it's not just what do you do about property taxes, but what do you do about our revenue raising system? So you need to be talking about sales and, you know, all of the other revenue generators that we have and thinking about whether or not they're equitable. People like to talk about, you know, our high property tax rates and, you know, those who pay high income tax, those rates. But when you look at objective studies that really fairly look at each state, and it's complicated because we all have different mechanisms for raising revenue and some of those don't show up in those state reports. The fact is Mont uh, Vermont is kind of in the middle of the pack. We may be high on some things and very low on other things, but at the end of the day, the tax obligation in, in the state of Vermont is somewhere in the middle of, of the 50 states. That's an okay place to be. Act 250, that's land use. Mm -hmm. that it's having, what, it's 25th anniversary yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Uh, and it, it hasn't been really seriously revisited. Do you think it should? Well, we're having, we have a, a, task, force. a task force, a commission <laughs> a to do this, this work. Um, it, it's a really interesting question. I don't know that they're necessarily going to be getting into 
what are some of the fundamental areas that we didn't take care of. Remember when we put Act 250 in place, we said we were also going to have a state land use plan. A exactly. And, um, and something else. I think it was three-pronged and we just did the one and I'm forgetting what the, I, I could be well, remembering Well, I think the wrong. criticisms of Act 250 are, if you had a time limit on this thing, saying that, you know, it is a process that it, at its most will take six months. Mm -hmm. or nine months. Mm -hmm. But sometimes Act 250 just keeps drawing on and on and on. So I haven't gone in depth with 250 related issues in some period of time, but in fact I believe if you look at the statistics, the vast majority of permits quickly. are issued very quickly, sometimes just, I think the majority of them with an administrative process and it's only the much larger, more complex ones which arguably uh, deserve more scrutiny. The other side, the, and an element of that, so is the system too complex? Fair, good question. We've certainly changed in 25 years. There are other things that we may want to add in. There are things that we may want to pull out. Those are all fair questions. Another element, though, of the system is the quality of work that people bring to the table. If you put together, ju just like any permanent a application, you can do it. Now a we're hearing a mayor speak. Well, or, you know, I used to, you know, work in a regulatory role for the state. You put together, if you know how the process works, you do, and you do your background work, if it's a fair system, you get through it pretty quickly. So you've got people who, you know, who are familiar with the permitting system and they know how to move through it. They know they need to bring this set of blueprints or this set of plans and, oh, I've got to remember, you know, to get the well permit or the septic or the road cut or, you know, the driveway cut. You know, if you know that's those, why we have lawyers who specialize yeah. in 250. Well, and that's too bad that it's not, you know, just people can do it, but if you're doing a very complex project, you probably want people with the expertise to Absolutely. help you out. What we, we forget is, and it was interesting to watch during the crash of 2008, um, you know, spurred by overdevelopment of housing. We ought to talk about housing at some point. Um, but in every, so many other states, there was this tremendous overproduction of housing because people could move through the permitting process. It was a, people thought that it was an easy money maker and um, a lot of people really suffered from, from that. We didn't see that in Vermont and that's not the purpose of our permitting, but our permitting process in general does require you to be thoughtful and careful and to ask deep questions before you make those investments. Is the State House working on housing policy in, that encourages housing in well, Vermont? And what, what's your view on that? Yeah, so um, we passed a very good sized bond, $35 million to support housing. Uh, Burlington has a 1% vacancy rate. We have a 1% vacancy rate down here. That's just untenable. It is a. It, what it is, is a vacancy rate? Uh, it's it's the amount of apartments that are, are are dwelling units that are available to people at any given time. I don't know the time right, frame right. that they measure it, but it's it's it, it basically we're is booked. A, yeah, we're booked, and it, it, and that means that prices are high. Um, there's not enough competition in the market to um, help hold those prices, and so it gets to one down. Which gets to well, the wouldn't you think that the market issue. then? I know would create yeah. units because you can turn, you can yeah. flip them quickly. Yeah, yeah, and and, and we're not seeing that. And that, I mean, that's kind of the generally the market is acting in a weird way, not just with housing, but you know also salaries. Wouldn't you think that if it is so impossible to hire people? that we'd be offering higher salaries to attract them, and that's not happening with wages in the state of Vermont either. But on housing, so I was, I was reflecting, and I, I've been very consistent in the issues that I believe are important to Montpelier to the, and to the people of the state of Vermont, and they all they revolve around the economy and poverty. 
in people's ability to, to thrive. And I, you know, I've consistently talked about housing, heating, and um, food as the kind of the three pillars of things that we need Can to pay really? attention to. Uh, and, and heating, can you really do much? Well, so let me let me let, let's finish the what, sure. the, the housing, housing conversation. Absolutely. We have a hundred people who are homeless in in Washington County. We sh we should be able to solve that problem. We should be able to figure out how to put a hundred people into some sort of safe um, place to live. There are twelve hundred people statewide. That is, you know. Compared to, to Los Angeles that has, what, 35,000 people on a right, given exactly. day? We can solve this problem. And I, 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 this is kind of the thing that I'm going to dig into hard this year. Is let, let's fix that problem. Because once you have a safe and secure place to live, um, you're less like food, stability, kids doing better in schools, um, hold a job better, your, your health is better. I mean, all of those things that we know throw you into poverty or keep you in poverty begin to be, you, you can begin to sort them out. Um, huge issue for our communities now is substance abuse, the opioid issue. Well, again, let's get people housed so that we can tackle substance abuse. And, and, and those related issues. How about the minimum wage? <laughs> That's the, the yeah. intersection yeah. of the economy yeah. and yeah. need. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've struggled, I past tense struggled with this when this was an issue. Um, frankly, came down to the, my committee. I serve on the House Appropriations Committee and that was the last stop of the minimum wage bill uh, for the House before it came to the floor. And I heard very clearly, and um, I understand what our downtown retailers were telling me, our mom and pops stores that I think are what are very the special. Backbone of, uh, They're the backbone you know, of. They, I, I love being able to walk down the street and not see a chain store and to know. But it's those, also those small ones you see on the roads as yeah, you're, as you're yeah, in the outers. Yeah. People, and, people just in working hard to make a living, but, but it's, it's not a corporate policy that you're dealing exactly. with. It's, it's keeping the books and the, you know, on your kitchen table. And I know for them it's very hard to look at the sort of wage increases that we're talking about. But at the end of the day, I came back to my feelings about the dignity of work and looking at the important policy changes over the past 120 or 30 years that we have made where we said, you know what? It's not okay to work seven days a week or six and a half days a jobs? week. Or how many jobs? Or that, that kids can work in terrible working conditions? Or how about if you get injured while you're working for your employer that you get fired rather than health care, which is what workers' comp is about. Those are all very significant increases, um, changes that we made that supported the dignity of work. And working for a livable, livable wage is part of that. So you have to weigh those two together. And how did you come down on that scale? So I came, to, I came down after, like, what do I do? What, how do I look at the stores? And I said, I've got to support the minimum wage increase over time. Um, pe people are not making it on our minimum wage now, and we've, we've just got to And the federals the are, are oh, punting that's the issue. Yeah, right. I mean, that, it's not even relevant, uh, because no one's working for that wage. Um, we've got to wa raise up wages. This is Montpelier we're talking about, which means I have to discuss the marijuana legislation. <laughs> That went through the House last year, and no one, it's, it's the baby no one likes. It's, it's partially there, it's not partially there. They decriminalized and only mm -hmm. partially legalized. Mm -hmm. As we're taping this, Quebec has mm -hmm. legalized, Maine has legalized, Massachusetts has legalized. What do you see in the next legislation, in the next legislative session for marijuana? Yeah. So I personally would rather not deal with it. I think we spent a lot of time, our 
poor judiciary committee. So one of the ways our legislative process works is that bills, proposals, get assigned to a committee, and our judiciary committee got the marijuana bill and spent a huge amount of time on it. And I think we have other important things to be dealing with. Um, I, I am fine with where we landed, which was the legalization, but not the tax and regulate. I know that people... Which still maintains a black market for yeah, marijuana. Yeah, I, 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 I get it. I understand, but at least we're not putting people in jail for um, possession. For possession, and yeah, ruining their lives that way. Although we could talk about criminal justice reform too. Uh, no, but I but, want to talk but, about guns. Okay, but but hang on. Yeah. So um, the problem with the tax and regulate system is is that I'm concerned. People say, "Yay, we can raise a bunch of money and." deal with those poverty issues you're talking about, Mary. You know, you could build more housing, you could put food in people's right. homes. Um, I don't think we'll raise the sort of money because of the need to do education on the use of marijuana. Law enforcement. Law enforcement, um, setting up another bureaucracy. I just, I, I, I don't see the that we'll see a lot of extra money coming in, and that would be the only. I, so I'm I'm not looking at the gray market problem. For people who were um, gun supporters, mm -hmm. uh, civil unions took two years to get through the mm -hmm. legislature. Death with dignity took two years. Yeah. Um, gay marriage took two years mm -hmm. and a veto to get through the legislature. Mm -hmm. This got through very very quickly. Do do you feel? that they might have a point that, that something happened that was extraordinary that in a process sense? Well, something happened that was extraordinary. I don't know that the process was subverted. Um, we, there have, in fact, been many gun regulation bills over the years. There have been multiple attempts to um, make sure that people are safe in their homes and in, you know, to make sure that gun violence is, is reduced. So um, it, it has been a long process. We just happened to have kind of the spotlight shown on a particular moment. Uh, it's, Marjorie Stone Douglas. The, well, I'm thinking now oh, of the, the uh, up uh, there, uh, yeah, yeah the, up the, here. The, the, here in Vermont, right. and and which the was governor, after that, right. which was after that. But honestly, why, you know, all of the horrific school what was shootings? That? You've been in there for why, ten years. Yeah, why, why? Why was it bottled for ten years then? Um, if they've been introduced over and over, and they were, in your mind, yeah. common sense. So. And I'm not saying they all were common sense, but there ha what I was saying is there's always been a conversation right. about how do we move this forward. It was not out of the blue. There, there has mm -hmm. been a conversation. I think over time people have become, uh, there, there has, we have reached a consensus, and that, that is our legislative process. It's very rare that we do kind of this earth-shattering move the world um, sort of legislation. Usually you slowly bring people along and that's what's been happening. So these horrific shootings around the, the country, I think we're bringing people along who, you know, were looking at their communities and thinking gun violence wasn't an issue. Um, finally started to see, oh, you know, if that can happen in Castleton or Pulteney, Pulteney. Yeah, how, oh my goodness, it can happen here. I and mean, then we've seen to our horror in, here in Montpelier. And it's very close to home. So I think people finally saw the light. In that process where you say it's been brought up and it's, it's going to come mm -hmm. again, is there anything in the next legislative agenda that you see from, that was left from last year, mm -hmm. other than another, yet another discussion on marijuana, that you see will come up in this legislative session. We're certainly going to talk about taxes. We're certainly going to talk about more about school-related ish issues. Um, I think the administration's proposal for some of the, the last consolidation questions, uh, which will affect our surrounding schools. You know, you, the U32 district is Absolutely. being told to behave in a certain way. So that's certainly going to be looked we'll at. Pay per, we'll Paid leave, 
come back again? I, I, so I expect paid family leave Excellent. will come back. I hope it will. And um, I expect the minimum wage will come back again. Uh, I, I hope that looking at funding for housing and my issue of what are we going to do about homelessness. Will the lake, will financing oh, the cleaning of the lake come Ab back? Absolutely. We have to. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got a, a, an expensive agenda in front of us. I'm going to close just on a, a question that only someone who's been in the State House as a Democrat for so many years can answer. What is the role of the minority Republicans uh, yeah. in the House? It's a very important role. And be, before I answer that precisely, let me talk about people see the debate on the House floor or the Senate floor, but we actually have debates because there really is a, a larger minority. Um, and sometimes it seems kind of cantankerous and, and a little clashy and, and difficult, which is good because that, that, that is a voice and, and it's important to allow that, not allow, but that every voice have, have a place. What I see happen in our committees, which is where the work on bills are done, is done, um, is this very civil, cordial discussion about how do we support what is important to Vermonters. And that, that is the question that all 150 members of the body ask themselves, and, you know, independent, prog, Democrat or Republican, I really am confident that that's the fundamental question is how do I serve Vermonters? And that's what we ask ourselves in committee. Uh, we have strange alliances. The most conservative guy on the Appropriations Committee and I, some, I mean, it becomes a joke because we're voting together on issues, but it's because Bob and I have worked our stuff out and we've, you know, we've moved more toward the center. Um, which is frustrating to people. I mean, Montpelier, if I could vote for Montpelier in the way most Montpelier people think, it would be a very, very different budget that we would pass. Um, you know, the piece of policy would be very different. But I don't just represent Montpelier. I do represent Montpelier, but I represent the state of Vermont and what's best for the state of Vermont. Was there anything more frustrating to you than Berlin Pond? <laughs> That's just confounding to me. And speaking of a local issue. Speaking of a local issue and to say, oh, don't worry about that. You know, if there's a problem, we'll just throw money at it later. Really? I mean, let, let's, why aren't we protecting our resources and making sure that we don't throw money at issues later? That, that, so yeah, that was frustrating on a local level. I, totally confused by the governor's position on our budget, which he said was a fabulous budget, which spent, came in at a lower growth rate than his budget did. Um, but then he vetoed it because we weren't spending money in that on ongoing expenses. And to me, that is just one of the worst budgeting practices there is, is to say, oh, I'm not going to worry about where the money's coming from in the future. I've got it today. It's in my wallet, so I'm going to spend it. And what we wanted to do was, was invest, pension, wasn't it? invest in the pension, where we knew we could buy down costs that would be significant over time. And it was like, wait a minute. I'm a liberal Democrat, and I'm having this argument with Republicans. We've just reversed our roles. Were there Republicans on your committee who were in favor of investing in the pension? Oh, absolutely. We voted it out 11-0. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just later it became political. At that point, we're going we're gonna to leave this. Okay. Thank and you, Richard. Thank you so very yeah. much, Mary, for being here. Thank you for watching this show. And I'll leave with the two things I always leave with. Watch the other shows. Watch all of the candidates. Watch Bill talk about the garage bond. Watch Bill talk about the water bond. And, but most important, get out and vote on election day. Encourage your family, encourage your friends to get out and vote as well. It's not only your civic duty, but it's your civic responsibility. Thank you very much.